Welcome. It's time for the further adventures of Indiana Jones. Sharing your adventures is an interesting experience. Pack your bag, grab your passport, and prepare to go globetrotting with Marvel Comics' classic four-color adventures of Indiana Jones. Jones? Jones! Dr. Jones, the eminent archaeologist. Hard to believe, isn't it? Ouch. No. What shall we talk about? Welcome, IndieCast listeners, once again to the further adventures of Indiana Jones. I'm Joe Stuber, joined, as always, by Keith Voss. Hello, everybody. Hello, Joe. Have you ordered your Blu-rays yet? Uh, not yet. Uh, I guess that's going to be the talk of the uh, the Indieverse right now, but uh, no, not yet. I, I, you know what? There's going to be plenty of them out there, so I'll, <laughs> I'll get them I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I, I read an article recently about uh, how they're going to release some extras, some 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 different extras or, or something included in the box set uh, off of Amazon UK. Do you know anything about that? I don't know. Hopefully uh, we've got some news on the IndieCast here or hopefully somebody knows about it. But I'm just looking forward to seeing a pristine uh, version of Raiders of the Lost Ark once yeah, again. Me too. And me too. Uh, I think a lot of us have a lot of those extras that are going to be on the – I hope they put some of the documentaries and things on there. Uh, that would be really cool. But you know what? It's Indiana Jones. It's Blu-ray. We're going to enjoy whatever we get. And I'm sure there's going to be 17 more versions on down the line. <laughs> no, no, there's not, Joe. This is the complete <laughs> adventures. Come on. Whoops, this I is forgot. the complete adventures. <laughs> it's the complete adventures of it. Does that mean there won't be an Indiana Jones 5? I'm just, you know, I'm just glad that they're not doing a child watercolor painting like they did for the Star Wars Blu-ray set. That's all I'm happy about. I, you uh, know, uh, there's, um, there's always <laughs> going to be something to carp about, I'm sure. Look, we're Indiana Jones fans. We get to carp about something. But uh, <laughs> it'll be something else to spend money on. Looking forward to it. But uh, even more so, I'm looking forward to this particular episode as our Further Adventures one-year Indieversary celebration continues. Last, That's right. Uh, last episode, we talked with Howard Chaikin, uh, who was the cover artist for several Further Adventures comics. He was the uh, interior artist for... Further Adventures issue number six. And something we neglected to mention last episode uh, was that he was also the cover artist for Marvel Super Special 18, the Raiders of the Lost Ark adaptation. We talked about that in an earlier episode, but probably should have thrown that out there uh, for some of the listeners the last time. Yeah, the one where uh, Indy looks like Dennis Quaid and Marion looks like uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus. <laughs> I did. We put that up on the Facebook page. And hey, weigh in. Let us know what you think. If you, if you think that they look like that, like Keith and I do, let us know. Uh, enjoyed that interview, but. Another member of the Mighty Marvel bullpen this time. Keith, who is it? None other than Mr. Kerry Gamble. And this is a lot of fun, this interview. And boy, do we find out a lot of interesting stuff. From yeah, Mr. we do. Gamble. And I, you know, I, I won't speak for you, but I will say that he is my favorite Indiana Jones artist, period. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I'm with you there. Um, Especially in the earlier books, uh, the, you know the, the artwork um, as the book progresses gets a little shoddier. And Kerry Gamble, I mean, he he is he is a legend. Um, that he is, and and he did some great work in some of our favorite issues. Yeah, and so. we'll talk about why uh, his run was so short. But for the books that he did, for the artwork that he did, and we'll and our listeners will be able to tell this from the interview. We'll see why uh, the artwork was so great. And uh, I'll be honest. The panels as we look through, and just even the layouts, uh, how he laid out the issues, to yeah, me, I think makes, he, makes him my favorite I, indie artist, period. I agree. I, he, he definitely gets indie. He gets the world of Indiana Jones. He gets the action. He, he, he draws action really well. Um, but even as all great artists uh, do, some of them have problems drawing certain things, or some things are a little harder than others. And, and as you'll hear in the interview... Um, Kerry Gamble had a little bit of a hard time drawing Indy's fedora and a few other little things that, that, that he'll mention in the, in the interview. But yeah, Some um, interesting tidbits. So uh, why don't we get yeah. right to it? Let's head into – while the Raven's Nest is, repairs are still going on, we're going to head into Club <laughs> Obi-Wan uh, once again to interview artist Kerry Gamble. Yeah, the place blew up. All right, well, we are uh, back in Club Obi-Wan while repairs are being done to the uh, Raven's Nest. And, uh, boy, we've got a, another great guest uh, lined up here on the IndieCast. Uh, let's take a look at this resume. Power Man and Iron Fist, Marvel Team-Up, 
uh, Spider-Man, Conan, uh, Superman, and of course, The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, our favorite. Uh, we're of course talking to Mr. Kerry Gamble. Mr. Gamble, uh, thank you for joining us here today. Hey, my pleasure. Uh, what a, are there any characters you haven't done? <laughs> I'm looking at this resume here. It's just, uh, done just about everything. Uh, I got to do most of what I wanted at Marvel. I never got to draw the Silver Surfer, who was a big favorite of mine. Uh, I grew up reading the, that Marvel stuff in the mid sixties and late sixties. And, uh, the John Buscema series with the Silver Surfer in the late sixties was my all time favorite. So that's, I never, um, got, never got to draw him. That's uh, Stan Lee's favorite because people always ask him in comic conventions. I've seen him talk a few times, and they ask him. And I, I would always think Spider Man or something like that, but he says Silver Surfer is his favorite. So, mm. there yeah, you go. it was it was a real writer's character. So I guess he he liked doing all that philosophical dialogue and stuff. Well, we talked uh, before we get into comics, uh, and and it's something you're known for now. But uh, boy, early on when you were a kid, you've had a fascination early on with horror films. I think oh, yeah. it was, uh, was, was your early fascination. Uh, let's hear a little bit about that. What were some of the, you did some fan films before, I guess before they were called yeah. fan films, but, uh, what some, what were some of the things that you worked on as a kid and, uh, how did that sort of inspire you into the world of comics as well? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm what they call, uh, a monster kid. Back in the, in the late fifties, they released all the old, uh, classic universal monster movies to television. And, uh, Back then, you know, local TV always had a lot of uh, personalities, you know, the kids' shows and stuff. Everybody had a, a host, and there was these horror shows that were on usually on Saturday nights all around the country. They had different characters from the local station. We had a guy in Fort Worth and Dallas named Gorgon, uh, and he would introduce the movie. The show was called Nightmare Theater, and... It was just what I lived for every every Saturday night at at seven thirty. You know, I was there waiting for the monster movie to start, and uh, and so that started a whole uh, slew of monster uh, products and things. You know, kids were just so into that. The, there were model kits that all the kids that I knew had uh, of Frankenstein and the Wolfman and Dracula and things like that, and monster magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland and. You know, shows like The Monsters and The Addams Family, you know, came on TV. So there was this little small, you know, period of time there that monsters were just everywhere and very popular. And I was just, you know, right in the middle of that. And so my dad was a uh, amateur photographer uh, and he, you know, took pictures constantly and had a movie camera. And we used to borrow his camera and make our own little films sometimes. Uh, you were Super 8. This was before Super 8, but yes. I, mean, <laughs> I was thinking the movie. That was you. Yeah, that was the movie, right. Wow. Yeah, but we used Standard 8, so they'd have to make a movie called Standard 8. <laughs> That's the sequel. That, that, right. That'll be the sequel. Or a prequel, maybe. Prequel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but of course, you know, no sound or anything. They were just, uh, you know, we'd make these little three or four minute things. And uh, Did you like them? I mean, are, are, do you still have them? You can go back and look at them? Well, yeah, there's a DVD that uh, some people put out a few years ago called Monster Kid Home Movies, and it's uh, got some of my films <laughs> and a bunch of other people that just, you know, were made back in the 60s mostly. And uh, You can get it online, I guess. I'm not sure what the website would be, but if you just Google Monster Kid Home Movies, I'm sure you'll find it, or maybe it's on Amazon. All right, well, I know what I'm going to do after this interview. Yeah, I need sounds, to get that DVD. That sounds so great. How did you – so uh, a young Cary Gamble – what did he want to be when he grew up? Because it wasn't, I don't think you were thinking comic books at that time, were you? Not that early. I was, you know, would have loved to have, you know, been in monster movies. You know, that was what my life kind of revolved around. So that's if I could have picked one thing. But I liked comedy a lot, too. So I, you know, watched all the, back then, the shows like Red Skelton and Danny Kaye and Dick Van Dyke and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I would have loved to have been... You know, a comic or a or a monster, one of those two. Uh, well, a remake of uh, Evan Costello Meet Frankenstein probably would have been oh, yeah. right up your alley. Yeah, that was the first actual monster movie I ever saw. I think I really? was six years old, and and it was so cool because they had Evan Costello, and then it had all the great monsters. And, uh, that that's what hooked me. Still my favorite yeah. comedy to this day. Um, so yeah, how did it, you? It is a classic. How did you yeah. transfer? How did you transition into the uh, comic book world then? Uh, I got into – I read a few comics when I was really young. Uh, I was big into the Superman television show as a kid too. Uh, the George Reeves show from the 50s uh, was still on you know, five days a week when I was a kid. 
And uh, and I vaguely remember the newspaper story when George Reeves committed suicide. I remember my mom kind of having a little talk with me about now he wasn't really Superman. He was an actor and he couldn't get work anymore or something. She tried to explain the circumstances to me. And I was always glad of that, too, because that was one of those things back then. There were all these rumors of the kids on the playground, you know, that you hear the guy that played Superman jumped out of the window because he thought he could fly and stuff like that. So. But I, you know, remembered the real story from the paper that he had shot himself, and it wasn't that he, you know, thought he was really Superman or anything like that. Uh, so Superman was a big uh, part of my childhood just because of the television show, and I remember buying a few comics and didn't really get into them because they weren't as much like the television show as I wanted them to be. You know, I wanted to see the same stock footage of him going into the storage <laughs> closet, you know, and that. That same shot of him flying and everything, and it, and they just you know had a lot of kooky stuff going on that I didn't uh, didn't really get into. But uh, but then I got into Marvel comics in about you know sixty seven or so when the the cartoons started coming on Saturday morning of Spider Man and the Fantastic Four, and uh, and I thought Spider Man was just so cool, just that idea of a guy swinging around you know from building to building on a on a web. And of course, they had that cool, you know, theme song that's still real popular today. And uh, and then a friend of mine at school had been a closet comic book reader, uh, but you know was afraid to tell people about it because they didn't want them to, you know, laugh at him or anything. Back then, you know, if you read comics when you were, you know, not Just in diapers, stuff. you know, yeah. So. I remember reading one on the school bus and some girl going, oh, look, he's reading a funny book, you know, and it was just, you know, they would really uh, give you a hard time back then. So when he found out that I was watching those cartoons and I thought Spider-Man was cool, uh, he said, well, you should see the comic books. And so he had several of the back issues and uh, at the time, it was a pretty neat time to get into comics because they were reprinting all the early stuff. Uh, and you could still find the old comics if you went to, you know, like used bookstores, you know, and these uh, junk shops and stuff that would that would carry used comics for, you know, a nickel or a dime or something. And we'd go downtown to this place in Fort Worth called Thompson's Books, and uh, they sold comics for 10 cents. And, and we picked up a lot of the early Marvels back then that you could still find uh, pretty easy. So I, was, I got into the Steve Ditko Spider-Man stuff. Uh, you know, he wasn't drawing it still at the time, but I was getting the back issues. But Marvel was actually reprinting those two, and Marvel Tales and Fantastic Four were being reprinted. Uh, so you get the modern stuff, and you could catch up on the early stuff too at the same time. Uh, but I really became a you know full-fledged Marvel comics fanatic there in the in the '60s. And, um, How did you turn that into illustrating then? What what was the process of going through? What did you have to do to to become an illustrator? And and how did you get your first work? Uh, well, I'd been drawing since I was a kid too. You know, that was uh, yes, yeah, kind of what I wanted to be before. You know, and I like I said, if I had my pick, I'd be you know an actor in the movies or a comedian or something. But everybody assumed I was going to grow up and be an artist because I just drew all the time as a kid and was always kind of the standout artist in the in the class uh, during grade school and stuff. So I always kind of had that drilled into me that yeah, you're going to be an artist when you grow up. And so. Uh, so once I discovered comic books and got into that world, it's like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, if I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to draw comic books. So I just, you know, did a lot of work for uh, some of the fanzines back then uh, in the '70s, that, uh, which was a good chance to get your work printed somewhere and see it, and you could kind of learn a lot by seeing it reproduced, and uh, and just started doing samples and you know sending to people, and then I. Uh, I met Stan Lee at a convention in Houston in, I guess, 78, uh, around that time, and uh, and had a lot of samples with me. And, and so he looked at them and, uh, you know, said to send them to him in New York, and he would uh, show them around to the editors and try to get me started with something. So that's pretty much the big break right there. And a pretty good run on uh, – what was your first um – Run on Marvel was a Power Man Iron Fist. That's yeah, the first regular series that I had was Power Man and Iron Fist. Uh, the, at first, they they would give people that were starting out what they called filler stories or uh, inventory stories, and uh, so they they'd have they wanted to like one book 
kind of in the drawer in case of any kind of emergency. They could pull that out and print it. And so I did uh, inventory stories of uh, – I did a story with Spider-Man and Daredevil in it so they could run it in either book or in Marvel Team-Up. And they ended up running it pretty quickly uh, in Marvel Team-Up. I think it was number 73, something like that. <clears throat> and So that was my very first uh, work for them. And I did a, a Doctor Strange fill-in and I did some stuff for Savage Sword of Conan and uh, – then I did a, a Star Wars story that was not printed for like three years, <laughs> but uh, at the time they were needing a lot of Star Wars work because they had uh, a Star Wars comic in uh, Europe or in England, I guess, that was uh, <clears throat> like bi- bi-weekly, I guess, every two weeks. Um, so they needed more Star Wars stories uh, for there than they were printing actually over here, so... Uh, but by the time I finished it, they, uh, they, I guess they never ran it there. It was, it was written by Mary Jo Duffy, though, and she liked it a lot, and she was the writer on Power Man and Iron Fist. So that's how uh, I ended up getting that book when they needed a new artist for that. Well, she liked the Star Wars thing I had done. And, and what was the uh, cantina scene that you had done for Rocket Blast Comics Collector? How did that come about? Uh, yeah, that was something the, the editor of that asked me to do because the uh, – it was just a two-page thing, right, with the cantina? Right. Yeah, I guess it was the original Marvel adaptation of Star Wars had sort of a lackluster version of the cantina scene. Of course, those guys had, hadn't seen the movie yet and you know, probably wasn't even finished at that time because I know the cantina scene was something that was done. Uh, it was sort of spruced up later. Uh, Rick Baker uh, is a friend of mine, and uh, he's told me that they they filmed all that you know, in one day, uh, he wasn't even there actually because he was working on the Incredible Melting Man. But they got his uh, crew to to come in with a bunch of masks and things, and <clears throat> kind of redid some of the, the shots for the Cantina scene because the stuff that uh, Stuart Freeborn, the makeup artist in England, had done all these characters that were f- kind of familiar looking. They were like animal people, you know, that kind of walrusy guy, and you know, there's a, a lot of characters in there that just sort of look too much like animal people. So Rick's crew did a bunch of masks that, uh, you know, were a little more alien looking. They did the cantina, uh, you know, band and and they did a new head for Greedo where where he moved, you know, the little antenna kind of things, the ears move around and stuff a little more. And um, and they insert all that. So, so when you see Greedo and Han Solo in that scene, you know, the shots of Harrison Ford were all done in England, and the stuff of Greedo, you know, across the table were done months later in, in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, they they had they had a different. Uh, I think it was an actress to come back and play Greedo at that point. So yeah, totally different actress. Even you went from um, drawing one type of su- superhero to drawing a completely different type of superhero, Indiana Jones. How did you get involved with uh, with uh, Indiana Jones? Well, I was a big fan of the movie and and of the. Uh, the the movie of course itself was inspired by the old action serials and i'm a huge republic serial fan so uh so i really like the source material which i thought a comic book uh since it's done you know in monthly installments you could really do something that was much more like the serials and do these little chapters and uh cliffhanger endings right you know, you know so it really worked really well and uh, and unfortunately, the way that I uh, got into it with the, the previous artist, uh, Gene Day, uh, just passed away suddenly. Apparently, he was a heavy smoker, and and uh, you know I don't know anything about him personally, but he you know just didn't have the best lifestyle, and and then just uh, died of a heart attack one day, or I think that's what it was. So I happened to know that they would need somebody for the for the job, and uh, and it was something that you know I would like to draw i think at the time i was still drawing marvel team up uh which was cool you know to be drawing spider-man but i didn't really feel like it was part of the regular marvel saga overall because it was you know just two characters getting together and you know fighting and and it was a little frustrating on that book also because they had a different guest star every month and uh and I always felt like about halfway through the issue, I was getting the hang of drawing this this other character, and then you know it would be over by the time I really got good at drawing him. And then the next month, I'd have to start over with somebody else. 
So I kind of wanted something more consistent. But uh, it was mainly just that, you know, uh, I knew they had to replace the artist on it because of the circumstances. And, and it was something that I was, you know, very interested in doing. So I told them I'd like to draw it. And they said, OK. You were supposed to do issue number six, which was Club Nightmare. Uh, why didn't that happen? I don't really remember why they they started me a month later. Probably just to give me more time, you know, to build up. Because I was never the quickest artist, and that's really the reason I wasn't on it very long. Is that I just couldn't keep up with it because it was pretty demanding uh, with all the period settings and and trying to get the likenesses of the characters and. Uh, and just it was so much action and stuff every issue uh and i always did a lot of research on each book uh when i was drawing it but i think that's probably why they didn't have me draw number six they just said well let's get somebody else in there for a month and then start you with the next one yeah Which, it yeah. was the um the first appearance in the series of marion ravenwood were you a little disappointed that you didn't that you weren't able to be a part of that i uh, don't think it really occurred to me okay <laughs> No, she she hadn't been in it before uh, number six. Number six was her first appearance. The fans were were writing in, um, requesting her, and yeah. yeah. Before I mean, Marvel did the the adaptation, as I'm sure you know, of Raiders of the Lost Ark. But then mm-hmm. once they started the further adventures, uh, she was she wasn't anywhere to be seen until issue six. Yeah, well, I guess I'd forgotten that she wasn't. <laughs> well, since you had brought well, up now, a- retrospectively, I'm disappointed that I didn't get to draw her return. Oh, I'm sorry to <laughs> <laughs> sorry to bring that disappointment. I'm sorry to bring that up then. Um, you had mentioned uh, since you brought it up about the lateness. Is that something? Because I think I had read uh, an interview with you right around the time you were getting the Indiana Jones book, and you had referenced uh, your lateness on Power Man and Iron Fist. Uh, is that something that sort of concerned you, or that you knew going into that? And and was that because of? Well, you tell us why why you were having a, an issue on that book. Uh, I don't know. It's something that. You know, it's always been part of my career, and that I don't, I'm not really thrilled about talking about it. But it, uh, yeah, I've always been late on everything I've done. I was part of the reason I probably wanted to do Indiana Jones at the time uh, was I was always looking for something that would keep me at the drawing board and keep me interested, and and because uh, I was always sort of putting things off and thinking I would catch up later. I was always like doing homework or something, and drawing is not. Is, is easy for me and natural as, as a lot of artists that in the business I'm just in all these guys that are just kind of like machines and can sit down and just stuff just flows out of them and to me it's just it's like doing math in your head all day uh, just constructing you know all these characters and you know drawing all the backgrounds and things and so it's uh, it, it's it's a little bit hard for me so I guess that's why I you know tend to put it off and, and always looking for something that you know, I might enjoy enough to to just sit at the drawing board for ten or twelve hours a day. Well, here's a Sounds quote from exhausting, that. Exhausting, actually. <laughs> Sorry. Here's... Sounds exhausting. It actually. Here's it a quote is. from that interview. It says, <laughs> "You uh, talking about getting the Indiana Jones book? You said I think it would sort of satisfy something in me that superheroes don't really, because to me they will always be two dimensional." Yeah. Well, that uh, is part of that. Uh, that separation of the movies and the comics, you know, I, I like both of those worlds, but uh, it's a little like, you know, the Superman comic story I told earlier when I picked up the comic books and it didn't look like a real person like George Reeves. Uh, so I, the Indiana Jones thing being, you know, flesh and blood to me, you know, I can see a real person when I'm drawing that and, you know, trying to capture that feel of uh, of a movie, you know, rather than, uh, you know, like Jack Kirby, you know, the king of the comic books, just, uh, he was great, but you look at those characters, there's no way you can picture them in a real world, you know, as real flesh and blood. It's just a whole different kind of dimension that you sort of have to get into when you're, when you're reading those. So, um, so well, let's talk, let's talk about the books. I mean, cause these are, we've got four books uh, that you worked on, uh, mm-hmm. further adventures of Indiana Jones, seven and eight. And also 11 and 12, uh, they're some of our favorite issues as we're going through these and just uh, sort of refreshing our mind. Uh, the detail is just uh, insane on some of this artwork. We really Amazing. appreciate it. Yeah, um, issue 7 itself, Africa Screams, uh, you know, aside from uh, a great Abbott Costello movie, <laughs> you yeah. got a chance to work on uh, this with David Michelini. Uh Let's talk a little bit about the relationship that you have with the writer 
uh, David Michelinie, and also uh, the the relationship you have with the Inker, who in this case would have been Sam De La Rosa. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you how do those dynamics work for you? How do you approach these situations with both of those relationships? Uh, well, it's just uh, you know, like any comic book, it's a collaboration of people. Now, the Inker Sam De La Rosa in this case uh, was a friend of mine. He lives in San Antonio, and so I would see him at a lot of the local conventions and. Uh, and I liked his work a lot, and so they asked me who I might like as an inker, and, and I mentioned Sam, so they got him. So that's probably the only time in my career I actually you know, had a say in who was inking the book. Uh, now, David, I didn't know. I'd never had worked with him before. Uh, the only thing I remember, we, I went up to New York uh, to meet with uh, Louise Jones and with David uh, and talk about the you know, how we were going to approach the book. And I wasn't real thrilled with some of the the directions he wanted to take it because they wanted to really sort of marvelize Indiana Jones and, and do a lot of stuff that was, uh, I don't remember exactly how it was it was termed, but, but I could see they weren't approaching it the same way that I would like to as far as the old movie serials and, and trying to make it very, you know, cinematic and action-oriented and, and and you know i wanted to do uh, like four chapter story arcs and have a big conclusion at the end of that and and really kind of do it like a little serial which would be you know if if the average serial ran for uh you know like 12 chapters or 15 chapters sometimes it would be about the same time length you know if you did four monthly chapters and and then wrapped it up uh but they sort of compromised and said, well, why don't we do like two chapter stories, which I thought was just insane. You know, why not do these big epic things and uh, and have a cliffhanger every every issue? You know, that to me would, would be the big uh, attraction. And it just seemed like a natural to me, you know, to do cliffhanger endings every every issue. Well, it's interesting you mention that because we early on in our uh, segment here, we talked about the John Byrne issues. And that seemed to be one of the issues that he had was that at the time, I guess Jim Shooter wanted these one issue books in case somebody missed an issue or whatever, and they, you know, these self contained right. stories. He wanted to do chapter, 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 and have these, which now is common with six mm-hmm. issue story arcs and trade paperbacks and things like that. So uh, that's not, uh, you're not the first person to tell us that. And apparently, you guys were way ahead of your time <laughs> <You're> thinking, <laughs> thinking well, ahead for the eventual trade paperback coming out. That's right, but that's the way comics were in the sixties. You know, I mean, the, the part of the fun of reading the the old uh, Stan Lee stories was that it never seemed to end. They always, you know, <laughs> left you hanging from issue to issue, and it was it was a little more like a soap opera than a serial, I guess. But uh, but he would basically do sort of story arcs. He kind of had these running subplots, you know, in the books, and then but there were hints as to what was coming up in the future and. It was a, uh, it was you know neat to just read a month to month because they were you know it seemed like a big continuing thing. Uh, well, they got us remember... coming. Sorry, I was going to say they got us coming back for more uh, every time, uh, especially as kids reading this book. I, uh-huh. I, I remember coming back for more. I mean, regardless whether it was uh, a one shot or um, or a continuation of uh, in two issues. Right, but you are right about Jim Shooter. That was uh, one of his policies. Was that uh, he? Uh, a lot of the stories in the late seventies had gotten to be just the the only reason for being was to explain something you know that happened between this issue or that <laughs> issue. And the, the the writers at the time were kind of that second generation, you know, had grown up reading the stuff, and uh, and all they want to do was sort of regurgitate the old stuff or or you know, do things to, you know, make sure everything lined up in the Marvel history. And, uh, and Shooter was like, well, let's do, let's concentrate more on entertainment and, you know, getting the kids that have never read this book before. And, uh, so I guess he thought, you know, they don't want the kids to feel cheated when they get to the end and they have to wait a month to see what happens next. So, uh, so yeah, that was one of his things that he wanted to, he started the little, thing at the opening page of every book you had a little synopsis of the character and so if it was your first book you could kind of tell what their powers were because i do remember being kind of lost when i first started reading marvel comics and you just jumped in there and you had no idea who these people were and uh you know i wonder why does 
is Johnny Storm is wearing a Captain America costume in this other book because <laughs> Kirby drew him just alike. Uh, but uh, so it took me a while to figure out who everybody was and everything. Uh, Great cover on issue seven as we kick kick start it. And Keith and I were commenting. I, as far as we know, this was the first snake joke, uh, full blown snake joke in Indiana Jones: The Further Adventures uh, of Indiana Jones, and also the first and only dialogue balloon uh, that we have there. So yeah, um, the entire series. Interesting. Pretty cool job on that. What, what, what are your thoughts when you look at some of these covers uh, when you're going through? Uh, obviously, uh, Howard Chaykin did eight, but uh, you were able to do mm-hmm. some of these other ones. Are you, know, are you looking back? Are you happy with the work that, that you were able to produce on these? Uh, more or less, yeah. I, uh, I always cringe a little looking at the old stuff. and you know, see, <laughs> That hat was always hard to draw. I'm looking at that cover, number seven, and I don't like the hat on Indiana Jones. It looks too <laughs> floppy and everything. And these are my own inks on this. I usually didn't ink my own work. Uh, I wasn't that good at it, but uh, so I'm looking at this, and you know, some of it's okay, but by, I basically always tended to sort of over ink, and my my line work is just kind of sloppy and lumpy looking, and everything. <laughs> so, how about the inks uh, within the book, within the books themselves? Are you happy with how this all came out? Yeah, uh, pretty much. I'm looking through here. I one little thing that most people don't know is uh, Sam. I guess was running a little behind. He tended to overcommit himself. And there's a little section in the middle of the book. I don't know what page it is in the real comic. In the omnibus, it's uh, 235. And the next, like, three or four pages were inked by uh, Jerry Ordway, who was helping Sam out. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which I found that out because I, I told Sam when I, you know, got the Xeroxes of the pages in, I said, boy, you really did a nice job on these pages. You know, you used a lot more quill work than, than brush work. I like the way they came out. Why don't you do more of that? <laughs> it's like, uh, Jerry Ordway actually did that. <laughs> what did you use for reference as far as uh, Indy, Marion, uh, Marcus? Uh, did you, I mean, how did you go off some pictures or how, how were you able to use some references for that? Yeah, I think I still have that folder that Marvel gave me, uh, which I guess was the all the reference that they'd been given by uh, Paramount or Lucasfilm or somebody when they were doing the, the first movie adaptation mm-hmm. uh, and it had all these stills and photographs they all had scratches through them and stuff you know so they couldn't be printed copy you know right but uh but they gave me a lot of pretty good reference and i could see there, there was like paint on some of the the pictures and stuff and i could tell from the colors oh this is what uh i get did shake and do that painting on the cover of the first comic the movie adaptation or oh uh, the, the um oh the, the marvel super adaptation? special yeah uh, the, uh, ooh, I think Chaikin did, yeah, with 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 Indy and Marion, and there's an Iron Cross in the background. That was done by Chaikin. Yeah, so I could uh, tell that that was, I guess, had been in his possession at one time when he was doing that painting because they had the same colored paint on some of these. Yeah, pictures. the Indian, the, the Indy on that cover looks. Uh, we always joke about it. Looks a lot like uh, Dennis Quaid. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Harrison Ford is is actually kind of tough to draw. I always found. You know, he doesn't have that classic hero face. You know, a lot of his appeal is in, you know, his personality and his, you know, expressions and things. But just uh, drawing the face, it's like, you know, his chin's not real strong. And, you know, the nose, you know, isn't like, you know, this Roman nose or anything. And uh, if you try too hard to make it look just like him, then sometimes, you know, it doesn't come across, you know, as a as a good heroic comic book face so i was always having trouble trying to make it look like him and also you know make him you know look tough and heroic and stuff well, that's well you what... did a great job with the facial expressions on all the characters i mean they're they're and i think i believe that was referenced in the 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 comic and former interview that was i mean they I, we think they're pretty much on the dot they're perfect oh uh, thank you yeah really that's one like... of the things you're known for is the facial expressions how do you work that into when you get the script from Michelini, how do you look at this and go, oh, I'm going to make this facial expression here and I'm going to tell the story through the character's eyes and the character's face? Uh, I don't know if there's any you know, thought pattern or anything that, that happens. I, it just kind of the way I approach it. Uh, I do think you know, the faces are what you know, gets across the emotion and the feeling and you know, what the character's thinking and stuff. That's one of the big challenges and the fun things about comics is that you know, you're limited to these still pictures, and you've got to tell a lot in those. And and uh, it was something that 
it was kind of surprised me when I got into the business that I enjoyed the art of storytelling really as much as I did, you know, the drawing itself. Uh, so that's something that I, you know, whether the drawing is that good or not, I'm always proud when I look through the comic and think you can really tell exactly what what is happening here and what the what the characters are feeling. And uh, you know, if you can look through it, and not even read the dialogue, and just understand the story, you know, then then that's uh, kind of my goal. Well, there you have it, IndieCast listeners, part one of our interview with artist Carrie Gamble, part two coming up on the next IndieCast. Keith, one thing I was really able to take out of that interview was uh, the pacing of Carrie Gamble, of doing the artwork, really was the result of the amount of research that he had to do for the character. Appreciate so much the amount of detail he was able to put into it, but I think that's uh, again from you know what he was saying is too is what ultimately led to the lateness of the books. Yeah, it's all in the details, Joe. You know, but unfortunately, it hurt him. Um, and even Elliot Brown mentioned like you know he loved working with Kerry Gamble. Kerry Gamble really is a talented guy, and unfortunately, it 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 hurt his work. You know, being being uh, that much into detail, it like you said, it made him slow, and they just couldn't. You know, their schedule just couldn't handle that. Yeah, I mean, they wanted him for issue number six. It didn't look like he was going to be able to to get that, so they gave him a jumping on point with issue number seven. But yeah, I mean, when you look at the the drawing, we'll get into this more when we talk about this in our reviews of the actual issues. But look, he's my favorite Indiana Jones artist. I mean, no doubt. It's just the amount of detail that goes into this uh, really nailed the character. I thought, and just some of the uh, just some of the subtle nuances uh, that went into this. Again, the research that he puts into this. Uh, and, and I like how he sort of compared uh, drawing a character like Indiana Jones, which we've seen Harrison Ford in the movie. We've seen all these live action things. It's very different as opposed to standard or typical comic book drawing. And he referenced uh, Jack Kirby, who is a legend, uh, legendary comic book artist. But that sort of comic book look, that comic book character look he had down – Again, we see how bringing a realistic portrayal of Indiana Jones really takes the book to a different level. But again, it's just because we're so familiar with seeing live-action characters at the time, back in the you know the eighties, seventies, and all that. That's right. And he he mentioned too that uh, Harrison Ford was very tough to draw. I mean, he wasn't the first artist that we've spoken to to state that he doesn't have the typical hero face, not a strong jaw like 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 he mentioned. But um, I, but but he does well. I mean, he, it doesn't have to look like Harrison Ford every time. And you know what, Keith, a couple of other things we want to mention, too. Uh, not mentioned in this part, but it's going to be in part two. But we want to make sure that we get uh, some links out uh, where people can learn more about Kerry Gamble. KerryGamble.com. It's uh, G-A-M-M-I-L-L, KerryGamble.com. And also Monsterverse.com. You can see a lot of uh, Kerry's work there. A lot it's of a things very going cool on. Yeah. yeah, that's a very cool website, A couple of great guys. sites. And he'll talk, about, he'll talk more about those websites in the next uh, episode in part two. And also, uh, if you have a chance, we referenced an interview uh, that took place back in 1982, right when Kerry was offered the book. He hadn't even done any of the pencils on Indiana Jones yet. Actually, his first Indiana Jones pencils were on the cover. It was Comic Informer Magazine, volume one, number seven. I've seen copies out on eBay. You can pick them up for a few bucks. Fantastic Indiana Jones cover by Kerry Gamble. Um, and the, yeah, and, and we'll we'll put that uh, that artwork up on the Facebook page as well. So yeah, you if you can can't get the out. interview, uh, we'll make sure that we get those those pictures up. But yeah, uh, also he worked with Ralph Ruiz on the cover, the interior cover, the pencils, the original pencils of the cover, and then on the front you see the fully colored uh, version, and also a really cool Captain America uh, back cover by Kerry Gamble on that as well. So make sure you try to get out there and pick that up. I will put a picture of those up on the Facebook page. Send that to Ed for the Flickr page as well. And we've got a lot more coming up in part two of our interview with Carrie Gamble. Uh, we've uncovered an Indiana Jones treasure like no other. You ready for this, folks? Unpublished indie artwork. And you're not going to believe the source material. No, I mean... We, we didn't. No, this, this was... I mean, we sort of say this in a few of these interviews that these bombshells are dropped and our jaws dropped. I'm telling you what, as soon as uh, this part came up in the interview, and you'll hear it in the next IndieCast, uh, man... Fan, still, fanboy central <laughs> yeah it, it's it's the the difference in our voices and and it's noticeable yeah it's it's, uh, it's a good one and uh it's something we're going to be talking about uh more on the next indie cast but uh yeah that that's going to be a, a great treat for the and listeners. don't worry we'll share we'll put it up on the further adventures facebook page we'll so you it, all we'll, can see it we'll send it to ed for the Flickr page so we'll we'll get yeah. that but uh yeah we always share here on further adventures of course. Hey, uh, how about we check out our mailbox? The 
Chester, you throw him out of that mailbox on me now. Oh, dear me. I haven't had so much trouble delivering a package since the incident in Vienna. What we heard from Thomas Riddle this week, who uh, IndieCast listeners know from the Adventures in Learning with Indiana Jones. Thomas writes, I had a privilege to meet Walt Simonson today at the Heroes Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. You guys will know that he wrote the comic adaptation for Raiders of the Lost Ark, so I couldn't miss the opportunity to have him sign my books. As soon as I handed him the Marvel Super Special Edition, well, Keith, that's the one we talked about a little bit earlier, he began turning pages and looking through it. He then turned to page five and began and telling a story about a revision that he and his team were told to make after they had completed the scene where Indy whips the gun out of Branca's hand. Walt said the screenplay they were working from had Indy's whip entangle Branca, which caused the gun to turn and shoot him in the gut. So this is how it was drawn. However, Walt says that the powers that be told him that Indy wouldn't shoot a guy, so a house artist went back and added an awkwardly positioned gun in one panel and then a silhouette of Branca running away in the other. Odd that they didn't have a problem with him later shooting the Kyra Swordsman. Of course, we know that scene wasn't scripted but improvised by Ford and therefore not included in the comic adaptation. So it seems the whole notion of a hand-shot-first moment isn't relegated only to Star Wars. Not only would Han not shoot first, but apparently Indy wouldn't either. Term tongue firmly planted in cheek there by Mr. Reynolds. <laughs> On a separate note, Walt also pointed out that he drew the indie used in the character corner of the covers and a few more things about the art that he did for the adaptation. In all, it was really cool. Hey, thanks for writing in, uh, Thomas. Yeah, we had mentioned a couple of those things. Uh, we talked about uh, that Walt had... Uh, worked on that corner cover piece. Um, got that information early on, uh, but yeah, we that when we interviewed the Simonsons uh, back several indie casts ago, that was something that came up in the interview. That story he had mentioned, but because for time we, I think we ended up having two other interviews for the show. We had to cut a lot of that down, edit some of those things out. So unfortunately, that was one of the things that hit the cutting room floor. Uh, but thanks for bringing that up because we definitely want to make make sure that we got that story in. And as far as the Baranka thing goes, I, I liked it better the way it was in the movie anyway. So I'm kind of glad that they that they uh, adapted it that way. Yeah, it was really comic. strange because when you when you kind of look at it, you you do see that little silhouette of him running away. It just seems awkward. Yeah, as it plays well, out in the comic book. Again, we've talked about the art uh, from that book many times, so that's just one of the other little interesting <laughs> things. But very cool story, Tom. Thanks for writing it, and also thanks a lot for including the pics of uh, of Joe and me. Uh, on your Adventures in Learning with Indiana Jones uh, website um, from your global screening party last year for Raiders 30th Anniversary. Very cool. Yeah, Again, we got a kick for, out of that. Thanks so much. Yeah, man. it was very cool to, to see the pictures. So um, Yeah, check out Adventures in Learning with Indiana Jones. Go, uh, there's a Facebook page. They've got the, the website. Yeah, go check that out because uh, Thomas and company really do a great job of, of bringing uh, Indiana Jones and history to life with that, especially for, uh, for the youth of today. That's right. And uh, while you're checking out other Indiana Jones sites on Facebook, you can come over and visit our Facebook page at The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. And you can also email us at thefurtheradventures at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you guys. Let us know what you think of the interviews. Let us know what you'd like to hear. And give us your opinions on some upcoming books, and we'll read them here on the show. Okay, that's it for the day, then. Well, as Indy says, that's all the time we have today for the further adventures of Indiana Jones. Coming up on the next Indie cast, Carrie Gamble, Part 2, unpublished Indiana Jones artwork. You don't want to miss it. You definitely don't want to miss it. And we're looking forward to having you back in Club Obi-Wan next time on the further adventures of Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm.